Hello and good morning everyone. Just about good afternoon. It is June. It's June 17th. It's our Wednesday devotional. A day to a time to set aside either now or whenever you're watching this. To set it aside to breathe in God's love. You might have a space that you've created. Or you may be hiding in a washroom away from the busyness of your household and that becomes then your sacred place. Wherever you are, when you breathe in God's love, it is sacred space. We have been exploring the concept of Sabbath. We have spoken about how Sabbath arises in the Ten Commandments, which is early into the freedom of the Hebrew people. The Hebrew people who had many ancestors of faith became slaves in Egypt. They lost their connection to each other and lived under oppression. They were freed by leaders who followed the call of God, not perfect leaders, but leaders who were able to articulate that God wanted them to be free and to live very differently than they were living. So Moses, Miriam, Aaron, and others sent, um, brought everyone into the wilderness. And with that, they had to learn how will we be together? How will we make decisions together? And the Ten Commandments were their guide. The first three commandments are about God's amazing divinity and how God can never be limited, how God can never be unalive. And the last six commandments speak about things we need to do or not do to keep our neighborhoods, our communities healthy. In between these six and that, those early three commandments sits a commandment that says that every seven days you will set aside one day and it will be holy. You will remember that God created the world and it is enough and it is good. And even God rested. You will remember that you are free and that you are not needing to enslave yourself to any system anymore because God has freed you from that slavery. We have spoken about how the Sabbath is both individual and communal. So while not everyone is able to celebrate the same day, we have people who work on Sundays and people who, uh, for whom a day off comes more like two half days during the week. But no matter when Sabbath comes, it is a time to reconnect with God, with ourselves, our core values, and our spiritual friends to make well those relationships. I realize I have my notifications quite loud. Let's turn those down. It's so one of the practices you might make on Sabbath is to deactivate some of the notifications that you receive in your life, whether that be for me, it's my phone that is dinging all the time, but for you, it may mean um, even turning off that landline if you have one for a little while so that you can be with yourself or with the people you so choose. And we are reconnecting to God in that time. Today, I wanna to talk another about another R, some R words. I find, um, I use alliteration a lot to help me remember things. So thinking about Sabbath as reconnecting to God and ourselves and our communities and the earth, that kind of reconnecting. Today I want to talk about the way Sabbath practices can help us in reconciliation, fancy term for forgiveness. And uh, I have three words for us to remember, haha, another R word, uh, Sabbath. 
in Sabbath time, one of the things that God calls us to do is to realize, to recognize that we have deep emotions and that all of them need to find a way to be expressed or recognized either to ourselves in a journal out loud to a trusted friend but there are some emotions that also need to be released after they've been recognized and realized we need to release them to god and in particular these are guilt anger feelings of shame and resentment like all emotions, usually you, when you pick up one of them, there's a whole bunch of other ones attached. Usually when I am scared, I'm actually hungry. And usually when I'm angry, I'm usually very afraid. And so no one emotion uh, will be a part of this journey for you. But Sabbath, because it's a regular routine, is a good time to check in with yourself, to discover if there is something you need to release, to forgive. Now, reconciliation, which is a, a bigger word um, and it kind of feels like a fancier word than forgiveness. And that's because forgiveness can be small acts, uh, individual acts, and reconciliation reminds us that we are all related to each other, that the act of forgiveness to one person impacts the community. Reconciliation is also used when we speak of large groups needing to come to peace together, or when we look at uh, groups of people who've been treated differently. So for example, the indigenous people of Canada, Inuit, First Nations, and Métis asked for us as Canadians, all of us, to say, what would truth and reconciliation look like? It is not an easy process and it is not a short process. So reconciliation can mean those big communal conversations where things have to be recognized and realized and then released in some way. So I today won't go to those big things. I find that practicing on smaller things helps us then approach larger things. So we will look at forgiveness today and I'm using Jan Lynn's resource. She has a book based on the serenity prayer called Living Inside Out. And she uses the serenity prayer by Reinhold Nierberg. Oh, I can never say it right. Nieberg, uh, to talk about where does serenity and peace come from? Where can we find the courage to act? And how on God's green earth do we find the wisdom to know what to do? Desmond Tutu, uh, past Archbishop of South Africa, has written a book uh, with his amazing daughter about forgiveness. And that is another great book for step by step by step walking through the process of forgiveness. So I'm going to talk about some things that forgiveness is and is not. But first, I want us to remember what Jesus said about forgiveness. He first noted that while it is scary to forgive, and while we might feel like it just makes us less, that being the least and the humble is actually our call when we follow Jesus. So in Matthew chapter 18, it begins that Jesus was asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus went and found a child and put the child among everyone and said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. 
Mm-hmm. And so while taking on the challenge of exploring those emotions that are heavier or more negative, it is a call to become what may feel at first like less. And in that becoming less, Jesus says we will find the kingdom of heaven, peace, reconciliation, relationship with God and others. Then later in that same chapter, Matthew 11, Peter, who has been listening to Jesus for a while now says, Now, Lord, if someone, like a member of the community, sins against me, how often do I have to forgive? As many times as seven? Oh, no, not seven, says Jesus. Seventy-seven. Wow. Upon hearing this wisdom from Jesus, It is like upon hearing all scripture. If you're like me, you immediately have questions. First of all, really, 77? And where do I keep count? And then I start to wonder, does forgiveness mean forgetting? Does forgiveness mean that I can or I can't set boundaries? And so that's what I want us to look at. These are ways in which forgiveness can best happen Again, these are Jan Lin's teachings, but they are found in all of our Christian traditions, these pieces. The first thing that I want to start with is for you to know that forgiveness is not an event. It is a process. Another reason why Sabbath is such a good time to reflect on if we have a need to forgive someone or ask forgiveness is it's a routine, a regular returning to a question that is never going to be solved in an instant. And so we have Sabbath. We have a time to do this hard work and we have time to set it aside and go do other work. Forgiveness is a process. So do not feel you are doing it too slow or too fast. The next thing she notes is that forgiveness is a choice. That it is something within my being and my power. It helps me have capacity to accept things I cannot change, to have willingness to forgive. It is not something I get when someone says, I'm sorry. I don't get with their sorry, the power to forgive. And if one never hears, I am sorry from the person who hurt you does not mean you cannot forgive them. And so forgiveness is a choice that is within you. It is a slow moving process of a choice but it's within you. Now, the next parts of forgiving someone help us remember what forgiveness isn't. Forgiveness is not saying what someone did or what a community did is okay. If the United Church of Canada ever receives from the Indigenous Church, a acceptance of our apology, which we have not yet received. They are still listening to our apologies, our life stories with them. It will not mean that the residential schools and all the other abuses that the Indigenous people disappear or that they suddenly become good things because we've been forgiven. Nothing can make good of the large systematic racism and other injustices. And when someone hurts you, that has happened. And it was not a good thing. It was not out of love or in love. However, 
you are still called to forgive, to release the emotions, the physical sensations that that hurt brought about in you, to release that into God. And to do so is not saying that the hurt didn't happen or that somehow we approve of what the other person did. It means we want to move past it as people, whether or not we hear an apology or not. Forgiveness is a long process, and this is the one of the reasons why, because we sometimes get stuck thinking that forgiveness is a blessing of the action that hurt us, and it is not. It's not a denial that the hurt happened. Instead, it is a freeing of ourselves, in ourselves, of the emotions of the hurt that happened and beginning to put down the things that it brought about to heal. One of the images that is used uh, often in 12-step uh, groups, but also in other places, is talking about something called resentment. Now, resentment is when you take sadness, hurt, grief, and anger, and usually a little bit of guilt, and you let them sit somewhere just warm enough so they'll grow mold. They'll start to smell. And all of a sudden, they are no longer five emotions coming out of a hurt or out an event, but rather a, a blob, a, a green blob maybe, uh, fuzzy, smelly, they become more than they ever were to begin with. Resentment. An emotion may walk beside you or within you, but it falls away when other emotions come along. Resentment is when something is clinging. Uh, it might be an emotion, it might also be a memory. The mind returns to the thought of the hurt instead of getting distracted by new possibilities. And we return and we return and we return and the mold begins to grow. Now, resentment can sometimes feel helpful because it feels like we're doing something to the person we hurt. It's a revenge plan. I will feel this way and I will just goo and goo and muck about in it. However, the problem with this is, is that the person who hurt you or the idea or the system that hurt you isn't living with the smelly resentment, the blob that keeps on growing. You are. And so the saying is this, resentment is when you prepare a poison for someone and drink it yourself. Resentment hurts you. And it doesn't solve the problem that's in the relationship or the problem that is in society. However, as I said at the beginning of this process, resentment feels good. It's like a break from feeling hurt or a break from feeling angry. It feels like a vacation. It's not. And it will never become again different emotions. It is now a blob of resentment and it will drag you down. Releasing resentment means giving up control over the memory of the hurt. Giving up control of your reaction to the hurt and perhaps returning to those individual emotions, feeling sad again that you lost a friend because 
there was betrayal or because you can't go back to a church you were a part of because there was hurt there. For some of us, this might mean a major relationship is in trouble and we have to work really hard to get it back. Resentment holds us to the old hurts. Releasing resentment to God allows us to look for the new possibilities. They won't be joyful all the time, but they will be things you can do. And it will clear out that yucky, smelly, growing thing in your heart. Experiencing forgiveness is something that we need to do for ourselves as well as forgiving others. As you take time during a Sabbath to think about what do I miss from a friendship? Why haven't I called them? Am I hurt? Am I feeling angry? As you reflect on the pain of a situation, you will note that you were part of that situation. It may not have been your fault, or you may have had a fight with a friend that was definitely a two to tango kind of thing, where you said things you regret and heard things that hurt. Forgiving ourselves and hearing that God forgives us is part of the way to learn how to forgive others. And as we forgive others, we learn, we get stronger in forgiving ourselves. It's like any good exercise. It builds up the muscles. Again, not quickly, not rushed, but it builds up the muscles. Learning to forgive. And when you have something in your life that feels too big to forgive, one thing to do is to Find some small things to forgive in yourself, a bad habit, or in others. Asking God for forgiveness is a good way to practice. What would it mean to apologize? As we think about that, we began to ponder who are we and what are our motivations? And compassion can grow when we realize that we are all deeper than one hurt or one apology or one forgiveness. One of the reasons why forgiveness is a journey, a process rather than a moment, is because it usually means walking through the steps of grief. We lose something when we are hurt, no matter who hurts us or how. In the midst of the conversations around anti-racism and racism, I think what some people are doing is grieving. They thought that the system had been fixed in the 60s and they had gone on their merry way because their privilege allowed them to. And they are grieving that for the last 40 years, things have been just as bad, just different. And so learning what actually happened in the residential schools means grieving the ideal version of settlers meeting First Nations, the ideal version of what a Canadian is. This grief is a lot of emotions. It's a walking through denial and depression anger and guilt, bargaining. And so again, returning to something you want to work on, forgive, on a regular basis, say on the morning of every Sabbath, allows you to then do a piece of that work, knowing it will not overwhelm you. You're going to put it aside at the end of Sabbath and go on with your week. You're going to try and be the best version of yourself and forgive others and, and forgive yourself and then come back again on the Sabbath and say, okay, 
Where is this sitting now? Am I sitting in a different stage of grief? Or am I ready to do next steps? Part of forgiveness is while not forgetting, it is changing things. Forgiveness means both making some decisions ourselves about boundaries, about next time I'm in a room and that happens, I'm gonna call it out or I'm gonna go for a walk and take my 10 seconds breathing so I don't say anything I regret. Forgiveness will mean perhaps recentering on those core values you have. And at times forgiveness might mean ending a relationship because it continues to be hurtful, both because of your actions and or the others. So forgiveness does not mean going back to how it was. Forgiveness means discerning how you want it to be in the future. Along with that, it means releasing the memories that come to mind about the event or the situation or the context of the hurt. To allow a past hurt, Jan Lynn writes, to have a hold on us rather than forgetting, not true forgetting out of memory, but rather getting emotional distance from the hurt. That is what forgiveness can bring. It means that the hurt pain, anger, it does not enter our conscious mind at the least provocation. The injury is no longer the primary focus of each day. And during the passage of time with forgiveness, events can recede into true past, become much less brilliant in our minds and much less harmful to ourselves. Triggers is a word we're using a lot more these days in many conversations. And triggers are both conscious and unconscious. There are things that your body reacts to because of an event in your life. And no matter how much you process that event, you will still be perhaps physically reactive. These are people with startle reflexes like myself. I startle at certain kinds of noises. And at the moment I am startled, I am also completely aware I'm safe. But my body still has that reaction. And so I forgive myself. Sometimes I have to explain myself to the person around me. But I don't try and fix it. But there are other tr types of triggers that forgiveness helps us let go of. There might be a topic of conversation that always brought you and your ex to blows. Always. Might have been something you said or they said. The blows might have been physical or verbal, or perhaps that horrible silent treatment. To forgive that person, along with getting safe from each other, distance, physical and other. Having less of a trigger means that when you hear the words that used to start the fight, you will still probably respond for a long time with a clenching of your body or mind. But the more time you take to process, the work you do to forgive means that your reaction will come just like my startle response with an instant, oh right, of course, this is not about the past event. Where was I? And you will return to your present moment. So forgive and forget doesn't mean you forget completely. It means there is less of a hold on you about those past events. And as I said before, forgive and forget does not mean forgive and go back to the way it was. You may need to change your boundaries, circumstances, relationships, 
to be able to find a place where the forgiveness work can happen. Sabbath is a gift from God for us to regularly return to God's understanding of who we are. God adores us. God forgives us. And God wants us to grow into who we were meant to be, to be in relationships that are life-giving, and to have meaningful vocations, families, and to have a good relationship with the earth and its peoples. And so part of Sabbath's returning to that sense of who God is, who God believes you are, is a great time to ponder forgiveness. In the ancient Ignatius tradition, there's something called the daily review. And you may find that every day is a bit much for you, but perhaps you could do it weekly. And it goes like this. What in this past week has brought me closer to God? What hurts, emotions, thoughts, actions have distanced me from feeling God's presence? And then a conversation with God about what needs to be released so that the next time you do a weekly review, you will be so much better at recognizing how much God is in your life active, moving, processing. May you know the love of God on a daily basis. May you find times to put aside your regular things and reflect, release, and reconcile. Bring yourself back to your core values, God's love, to your spiritual friendships. Know that I miss you and that I pray God is tangible to you today. I will see you again tomorrow at noon right here and we will take another step this time into Galatians to ponder what God is doing with us on these Sabbath days. Take care. Thank you so much for watching.